You ready, sir? I am ready. All right. So today we have uh, Greg DuPont from DuPont and Bloom and Steel. Greg is a seasoned lawyer with practice areas in the estate planning and administration, probate, bankruptcy, and financial planning. He's a certified financial planner. And to me, I think he's a pretty, uh, pretty interesting individual because he has a holistic approach to his, uh, his firm. Um, and I'd like to basically start off by saying thank you for joining us today in this podcast. Uh, and today's topic is going to be a very interesting one because it's going to be on estate planning, wills, trust as well. So uh, obviously with the pandemic out there going on, everybody is pretty much trying to figure things out as we t- take day by day. But I can say that confidently that Mr. Bond has probably seen a little bit of action with this estate planning, especially now with the pandemic. And from a preparedness standpoint, I think, uh, you know, we could just stop there and just uh, say thank you for joining me and then we could just jump right in. You're welcome. I'm glad to have the opportunity to chat with and you. talk to you about this oh so exciting topic which is estate planning. <laughs> so I'll, now, I'll, do, I'll do my best to not run away your audience. <laughs> no for sure. So before we jump into that let's let's look at a uh, uh, one part of your uh, from your journey. Uh, if we look at your website which is uh, the law offices of DuPont and Bloom and Steel there's a story on there that that talks about a $1,500 experience that you had before where you were working with a client and you saw that the client had uh, was being billed at $1,500 rate. Can you speak, shed some light into that? Because I think that may shape the audience's perspective of who you are as a lawyer today and what that, transa- that experience shaped you to be the uh, lawyer you are today. Yeah. So yeah, that experience that we talk about is uh, what was a transformative moment for me in my practice. Uh, when I was involved in a will contest, and I was sitting there in a room uh, out in Scottsdale, Arizona, one of my favorite places in the world. Uh, and I looked around the room and I realized that uh, all the attorneys in that room, basically their accumulated rate was $1,500 an hour. And essentially, my client's family was paying for that because they did not have somebody that they trusted as an estate planner uh, to be able to take care of changes that they needed to have changed when mom was getting older and was facing her her demise. Mm -hmm. Uh, And um, that is what led me to become holistic in the sense that I didn't want to have that ever happen to any of my clients where they ended up having to pay for a room of attorneys uh, all because their mom or their dad uh, did not have anybody that they trusted to take care of things for them. So you've been in in this practice for basically uh, roughly two decades now, right? It's even more than that. I started practicing law with a a focus on estate planning and probate essentially back in 1990 when I was uh, still in law school. I started my first position as a law intern back then, and I've been focusing on those type of issues ever since then. All right. So uh, it's safe to assume that that has pretty much positioned you in today's world to basically look out for the client's best interests and not not charge them astronomical rates like that, uh, which if you do, that's obviously understandable for whatever reason that would be. But um, but it's safe to assume that you don't you look out for your client's best interests today, right? Absolutely. So um, part of what I learned along the way is uh, that there just were not. Um, my practice is built around the holistic approach, and not only taking care of documents that are needed as part of an estate plan, but rather uh, the entire picture. Uh, in planning and building a long-lasting relationship. And that's what was missing in that situation where the family was ending up paying that kind of money because they did not have anybody that they had a, a trusting relationship with. So that's kind of the, the, the lodestar of my practice now. So when we look at the planning perspective uh, through this the, the lens of this pandemic or the, the lack of a pandemic, a planning, I'm thinking about preparedness, right? I'm thinking about to be to have a plan, you need to be prepared to tackle a problem. Um, and in today's world, when we have uh, family lo- families losing individuals uh, because of the COVID nineteen, so a lot of folks out there may not have either a will, a trust, or a DNR. Right? I do not uh, resuscitate. Can you shed some light into the those three words? Because estate planning may mean a lot of a lot of things. So a lot of people or a lot of people may not understand the complexity or the simplicity of it. And I'm saying simplicity because it's uh, it's not simple at all. Uh, there was a uh, an article that I was reading that, that brought up Robert uh, Sickhoff, which is a uh, co-author of Will's Trust and Estates. And he says that every estate plan is a drama in human relations. And I found that so interesting because maybe you could also share some light into that 
human relations as far as the drama that may be with uh, with estate planning? Yeah, there's a there's a lot uh, to unpack there that just threw at me. Uh, For sure. So let's let's talk a little bit about um, first of all, what is estate planning? For sure. Uh, estate planning is essentially uh, making sure that you have the tools in place to uh, to assure that your wishes are met when you are in the end of days and that your wishes are met when you have passed away okay uh, those ones that are in place for taking care of those latter days when you're not able to speak on your own behalf are the living wills the dnr and the financial power attorney that you reference the other ones a will trust those kind of things take place after you passed away and when we have estate planning and conversations Many times uh, you do get into those dramas uh, that you referenced uh, because um, I've seen it too many times over the years when somebody, the matriarch or patriarch, has kind of been keeping their thumb on things with a bunch of brewing problems below. Mm -hmm. uh, once they're gone, uh, then all those type of problems start coming to the surface. And so a properly prepared estate plan does what can be done to keep the type of simmering feuds uh, still uh, under control. Now, is it, because I know we have uh, uh, some legal uh, solutions out there on, on the web that anybody could just go out there and do it for free. Um, to me, I see that as a risk, where if you go out there and, and, and try to do your own, uh, and I'm not gonna name any names out there, uh, but it, what's the risk if you actually do end up not utilizing a lawyer? So. First of all, most of the services that you find out there on the on the internet, they they prepare documents that are perfectly valid and enforceable. They're very careful to set things up that way. Mm -hmm. the The problem with those type of uh, processes is that they lack the nuance uh, that comes from working with an experienced attorney. And first of all, uh, it's difficult enough to get people to finish up anything. Okay. Uh, but when you're dealing with death and dying, uh, if you don't have those documents done and completed absolutely correctly, then they're worthless. So you may have filled out a uh, a will on XYZ website and not signed it, not had it done the right way according to your jurisdiction. Hmm. And then you end up causing problems when there perhaps were not, hmm. because you've now created an ineffective document. Uh, that can be litigated. So, again, although they're they can be valid and they're okay, you only have one time in your life typically to deal with wills and things like that. So let's do it the right way. And what's the? Um, is there a certain time that people should be considering actually getting one done? In your experience, when is the right time or the wrong time to actually start one? Somewhere between becoming an adult and dying. Okay, <laughs> that's pretty broad. <laughs> so it's a cycle, right? It's a human yeah. cycle. That's right. Yeah. There, any any time after you become an adult, there there is a valid reason to have a will done, a financial power of attorney done, a healthcare power of attorney, living will. There's there's value to it at all points in life. So, so for example, if many times uh, when people are going off to college, their family would come in to me and have those documents done for them. Because they now realize that the kids are adults, and because of HIPAA laws, nobody can talk to the medical professionals on their behalf anymore. Mm -hmm. So they need to have some of these will type documents, the living will specifically, the power of for healthcare, so that somebody is there to be able to help them. And so there's really no time that's too early nor too late after you become a, an adult. And now, obviously, the other end of the spectrum, when you die, you know, or before you die. Uh, that's when we have even greater need for that, right? Because now the the end is near and it's, it's apparent, and we need to make sure that our wishes are taken care of. Mm -hmm. So, short of those two extremes, typically when people come in to see me, uh, they come in to see me when they've had their first kid, uh, or uh, they've had something going on in their world where they've been triggered, and they're very aware of this. Uh, like now with the COVID, when uh, you know my phone's been basically ringing off the hook with people that want to talk to me uh, and get their affairs in order. So uh, compared to last year, how, how much, how much of an increase have you seen on your, in your business? You know, the, um, 
the week before we had the shutdown, I did more wills in that week than I would do in a two month period in the prior year. Wow. And I do a pretty good number of wills. So yes. from that, and we're talking about in the state of Ohio, right? So yeah. in the state of Ohio, we've been uh, in a, uh, what is it? Week four now, week, week eight probably? Well, we've Hard lost track, track of it. Huh? We've, lost, we've all <laughs> lost track. It's, it's, it's Groundhog Day, Bill Murray, we each day we wake up and it's a different thing. Uh, so that was specifically uh, in the uh, first week of March uh, when I had hit that type of number. Yeah, because I, I have seen uh, some some uh, some news articles that people that essentially in lawyers in your field have seen an, an uptick, right? Which is completely understandable. So basically, every single change in your, uh, uh, in the life cycle that you see, like you said, from adulthood, you have a, a child. It's actually important to actually get these documents done. But there's a right way of doing it and the wrong way of doing it. What are the things that individuals should be considering to get in order before they actually go go to you? Or should they just go and have a conversation and then you'll give them the marching orders? So the way our particular process works is uh, once they've made a decision, they want to have a conversation, we walk them through the process from beginning to end. Uh, we send them now because of COVID, uh, we have virtual meetings to start things off with. Uh, where prior to that, uh, they will receive a detailed questionnaire that then drives our conversation. Are there uh, three or four things that people should be considering as far as uh, financial things that they should be getting in order, like their finances for you or uh, their assets? What are the common themes in, in that questionnaire? Um, the thing that people need to understand is the there's a difference between documents, what assets that documents like wills deal with, uh, and what their estate, broadly speaking, is. Okay, mm -hmm. um, and you know, for for younger people, you ask kind of the phases. For younger people, most of their assets are their uh, retirement plan that they have at work, and maybe some uh, form of uh, group life insurance that they have at work, and maybe a home. Okay, uh, but with assets like a retirement plan or a group life program, they have beneficiary designations. And that's all that's needed to make sure that those assets, if you pass away, go to where they need to go. Now, are there any uh, financial implications involved with this at all, if, if it's done correctly or incorrectly? Yes, depending. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the biggest mistake that I see people make uh, is with retirement plans, those type of things, uh, not having a beneficiary named on it. Uh, then now, because there's not a named beneficiary on that, then those go through the estate. and that causes immediate taxation of those assets as opposed to having some opportunity to defer the taxation over years. But other than that type of situation, uh, assets typically uh, for an estate, at least here in Ohio, where we have no estate tax, uh, and on the federal level where the estate tax doesn't kick in until well over $10 million, uh, there are really no tax implications. Now, is that when you say estate, is that uh, the probate process? So that is a, um, the combination of all assets in your name upon your death and insurance to determine what is your taxable estate. The probate process only speaks to those assets that are in your name and your name alone at the time that you pass away. Now, what kind of, uh, you, so you, you spoke about the beneficiaries would be one of the biggest mistakes that you have seen uh, within the course of your career. Um, are there any other opportunities that people should be considering? Because I know part of the process when you're filling out a 401k or whatever, they actually ask you uh, who would you would want to be if, as a beneficiary. But why would people not put that? Is there a rationale or rhyme or reason? Uh, oversight, typically. You know, um, yeah, I had a case a couple of years ago where the, uh, the beneficiary that was named in there uh, had died well before the person that I was administering the state of had died. And because that beneficiary had passed away, then by the, the document the, that controlled that 401k, uh, then that now gets paid to the estate. And so it goes through that process. So it's those type of things. You know, People tend to set it and forget it with their beneficiaries. And it's a good practice to periodically contact those uh, institutions that you've done that with uh, and, and have them verify for you. Uh, who your beneficiary currently is, 
uh, because as people change through life, you start your first job, maybe you've named your mom or your dad as that because you're not married at that point in time. Gotcha. And you just forget about it. So it may be a thing that you, it may be a, a situation where you will actually have appointed somebody in the, at some point, but you just, like you said, you said it, forget it. Now you're 10 years afterwards. Your parents may not be there. And now who does it belong to? Right. Now, how does that uh, in the court system, how does that get resolved? And that's probably a loaded question in itself as far as now you have that individual, your your former client or, or individual that has passed, they don't have a will or trust. How messy does that really get? And I think that goes back to that to that uh, that quote that I mentioned from uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Stickoff over there. Um, how messy does it truly get when it starts to get into the court system? The messiness starts with the family itself. Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, so, you know, over over the years of my practice, I've had people fight over the silliest things. Okay. And it's, again, as Mr. Stickoff says, the, the dramas of, of human relations. Um, once that person that's been keeping people in check is gone, then all those long held uh, animosities just bubble to the surface. And the probate process, uh, just like the uh, domestic relations and divorce process, uh, that's where if people have ill will toward each other, they have the opportunity to create all kinds of havoc without we don't have the right documents in place. Do you have any uh, examples that you can share without uh, releasing too much information? Well, I've had clients uh, over the years that have thousands of dollars of, of uh, legal fees on fighting over things like riding lawnmowers. You know, okay. Uh, that are barely operable. I had uh, a situation a couple of years ago where a uh, family, uh, a the, the, um, second spouse situation where kids from the prior uh, marriage, um, you know, thought that uh, the decades old tools were worth, you know, tens of thousands of dollars and okay. caused tens of thousands of dollars of damage with legal fees to find out that they were in fact worth nothing. Okay. So those are the type of things that are out there and without even going to soap opera topics where, you know, we have kids that were estranged from prior marriages and those kind of things that come out of the world. So, mm -hmm. but very basic, uh, you know, you're dealing with human emotion and, and sometimes the uh, rational value of things has no relation to the emotional value of things. Now, have you dealt with individuals that have assets outside of the United States as well? So an individual could have uh, an Ohio address, or Ohio assets, but they also have assets across, you know, out of the uh, out of the United States, across the pond, or down in South America, uh, wherever it is. How do you manage that that scenario? So the assets across the pond, or where have you, they're going to be dealt with there. You know, I have lots of clients that are Indian uh, and okay. they have lots of assets back home as well as what they've got here. So the estate uh, plans that we set up here, if someone were to die, they would have their primary estate administered here. But then those documents that we prepared here would end up being sent overseas, essentially, to administer those assets over there. So there is some type of synergy with now, wh which documents are primary then? In that in that situation, would the the American or the Indian how would that, how would that work? So there's there's really like one document, right? The will, okay, or okay. one document, the trust, okay, and uh, that gets its legal impact in the probate court where the person died. Okay, so a Delaware County resident uh, has property in India, well, and property here in Delaware County. Their probate estate is established initially here in Delaware County. And then the courts from Delaware County and the courts back in India coordinate on those documents that have been proven to be the legal effective binding documents here in Ohio to then whomever is taking care of their affairs in India uses those as their guidestone care of that there. That's pretty interesting. I've never even, I mean, that was a, a question that I had or here prepared for you, but there's one document and that one document pretty much is a driving force here in Ohio and wherever else. I know you mentioned India, but that could be also anywhere else around the world, correct? That's correct, yeah. Now, are there any advantages as far as having one or the other as far as the will trust or do they all should be in one package? So um, 
without getting too deep in the weeds, uh, yep. typically um, a will is something that is deals with the directive of those assets that are in your name upon your death, the probate assets. Mm -hmm. Typically a will is used in conjunction with the trust. Okay. Uh, and the trust, the difference is the trust controls only those assets that belong to the trust. Okay. So it's possible to have uh, assets that are managed by a trust and then assets that are not even part of the trust. Okay. And so when we use a will in conjunction with the trust, typically what the will does is directs things into the trust. So at that point in time, those assets are all managed by the trust there. Mm -hmm. The will is directly in the court. Uh, the trust does not necessarily need to be in the court. So you did mention you don't want to get too deep in the weeds, but uh, I'm assuming you could take that those comments and that thought process a little bit further. What are those... <laughs> what I, those can, I can get real deep in the weeds. If we want to put your your audience to sleep here. A little bit, a little. Bit, if you could <laughs> dig a little bit deeper there. Sure, certainly. So you're you're asking a lawyer to talk. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, uh, the will again is the is the primary document to direct what happens when you pass away. Mm -hmm. It's going to set up the structure for the assets that are subject to probate administration. We mentioned things like your your uh, retirement accounts and insurance. Well, those aren't necessarily subject to estate administration unless you have made the estate the beneficiary, okay? But the will is going to be what the law looks to to put somebody in charge of your estate. That person is who we call the executor. And it's give, gonna give them instructions on what to do with the assets in the probate estate, which could be give all of my stuff to my kids. And then it's over and done when the when that executor reports back to court that they've done it. Or the will could say, put my assets into my trust. And so now at that point in time, the trust takes over with the management of the assets for whomever are the beneficiaries of the trust. So typically we, we look at kind of the, the will is for, at least in modern plans, the will is for a short duration, settle your affairs. And the trust is there to manage assets for a longer period of time, either a period of time that starts when you pass away and the assets come to it through the trust, or in many situations throughout your life, uh, people have trusts where they put their assets into it at that point in time to gain some form of efficiency or other benefit to manage your assets through that trust during their lifetime. Short-term, long-term perspective, right? Uh, like you mentioned there. Now I can see how how person A, John Smith or Mrs. Smith, and now unfortunately something happens to them and now who somebody has to enforce this. And as far as their, their wishes, their wishes are documented uh, on these documents, but who who's the one that actually enforces these? Because obviously you you and your team have been the, the individuals that have prepared this, this strategy as far as after the after death strategy. But who's the one that actually enforces it? Because you have the state coming in. Is it the law enforcement? Is it who who would be that individual to enforce that? The person that enforces it is the person that you have named in your will as your executor. The executor, yep. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and they, by virtue of the will giving them that authorization, they go to the probate court here in Ohio, is what we call it, uh, to be appointed officially as that executor. And then that gives them the legal authorization to manage your affairs when you passed away. That seems pretty simple enough, right? When you have the, when you say, "Hey, I want Mr. Smith over there to be the the executor," but that could also get messy and complicated, can it? Absolutely, especially when you're dealing with uh, second marriages and those type of things. That uh, now we've got again those simmering problems from before. Yeah, uh, that can come to the come to the surface and. The kids that didn't like mom, the new uh, spouse, uh, then they can cause problems that way. Can you do you have any examples uh, from from that perspective at all from from your uh, experiences? Uh, oh yeah, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, you know that's when you start having the allegations that uh, step monster uh, is hiding money, so those type of things. Yeah, uh, or uh, or that. Um, that was the context of the $1,500 uh, an hour type of thing. Uh, mm -hmm. That uh, when we don't have a, a good plan in place, uh, then uh, those type of things can can definitely bubble up. You know? So typically it does 
you know, come out of um, disenchanted children, either, either from some fractured nature of a family, uh, that is the nuclear family, or you know, prior families of prior kids from prior relationships that uh, feel like they're being mistreated. Now, let's say there, there is somebody who's listening to this podcast uh, and has considered doing this, but just says, you know what, this is not for me. I don't have the time to do that. Um, and I just want to shed some light on Prince, right? The artist, uh, where as as a, as we all know, Prince passed away, and he didn't have a, a will or a trust. Now you have this individual with all this music out there, all this asset. Uh, have you ever had seen a situation like that in in your experience, or in the state of Ohio, where you had an individual not quite as rich and famous as uh, he was, but maybe with all those assets that that we we're talking about here? And a situation like that happens, what is the next step for an individual like yourself, a lawyer, that they say, hey, I need some help here? So uh, if there are, you know, there is no will in place, uh, then uh, we have a, a handful of laws that control what happens, but they don't uh, give us a lot of, uh, uh, they don't give us a lot of latitude on things, okay? So- Us, us meaning the- the estate, the executor, the system, okay? Um, so we end up in a situation where we are proceeding in the dark. It, again, think about the, the Prince situation. At least Prince had uh, business managers that knew what records he had, what, what songs he had copyrights to it, all those kind of things. As messy as that situation was. Well, I've dealt personally with estates where people have had bank accounts uh, in different uh, in places in Ohio, uh, and there is no uh, no evidence of where those things are, and so we have to go looking for them. Mm. And so we end up with you know just many many man hours trying to find those assets. So it's very important that we, you know above and beyond having the documents in place for estate planning that. And every once in a while, you, you make some note about where your stuff is <laughs> so that if somebody else from the outside has to come in and take care of things, then they have a benefit. You know, I only, you know, we kind of jokingly talked about between 18 and death. You know, one of the most messy estates I've done the last three years was a 24 uh, year old uh, that has you know, started accumulating some assets, had no will. And had nobody that was really there to to help them through things, uh, so there was a lot of unknowns, and uh, we had to dig a bunch of stuff out. Hmm. So you're, you're, it's never too early to have these type of, of uh, plans in place. Now, uh, how about uh, digital digital footprints? Is that part of your? Uh, we we had this conversation back in the seventies and eighties. Probably digital would not be part of the questioning or the conversation. Since you spoke about that 24-year-old experience, uh, obviously now social media is huge. People are texting back and forth. There's a footprint there. No matter how you slice it, there's a footprint there in conversations and transactions, uh, uh, documents that are shared back and forth in the dark, meaning that only me and the individual, now I'm not there anymore. Is that part of your focus as well right now? It's increasingly becoming part of the focus. Uh, because one thing you notably didn't reference there was uh, your X gigabyte terabytes of uh, pictures, right? On all your of, personal computer. Yeah, or just out in the cloud. Yeah, you know, all of that history. Uh, or uh, you're the um, what's what's going to be interesting as we continue on down the road is things like your uh, your record, what used to be a record collection, now being digital audio. Mm -hmm. video collection which now is digital video which um by many of the licensing agreements you never really own them right okay yeah uh, but uh, uh those type of things are increasingly becoming a challenge for estate planning and not all states have a good uh setup for that yet in terms of even authorizing in a manner that uh, the service providers will allow access to the uh the histories. So is there any guideline right now in the in the state of Ohio or in the U.S.? I know, and I, I know you mentioned that a lot of times there may not be, but is there any particular protocol or guideline for how to handle that at all? 
So not yet, really. Uh, I mean, there, there was a law passed that tried to deal with it, but it, I don't think it's very effective. Uh, so in Ohio, you know, the, the, the best thing to do is make sure that somebody somewhere knows the master password or whatever to be able to get at those assets, or you've otherwise left that in some format that if you did pass away, that can be accessed um, so that you can get in before it gets shut down. You know, um, on Facebook, I saw a couple of days ago, uh, uh, somebody posted on there that they saw a post from a certain individual that passed away and that individual said their goodbyes within, within five hours. And I sat there before our, our meeting today and I, and I was thinking about exactly what we're talking about here. Okay, then you have that individual that passed, Facebook, right? So Facebook, they may, like you said, they may own all this inf content, all this data of this individual. Uh, and I, my question was, who's going to manage that? Because that password could be as simple as, uh, as your home address or people put their zip codes or something like that or something as encrypted as a, you know, a pretty strong password. But like you said, if you don't have the password, that could be a challenge in itself. And I know for sure Apple, uh, Apple is, uh, th does not release their uh, the customer's data at all, even to the to the federal government, right? So what's to say that they're going to share it with uh, with your office because the wife or the husband or whoever requires to get in there and get access to their bank account information and so on and so forth. Yeah. So that could be a messy, messy road as well. And hopefully... Yeah, cool. uh, and hopefully there's a solution coming out of the pipeline later on. We keep working on it. Uh, <laughs> for now, uh, you know, we, we try the best we can. And it's a, it's, it's a complicated blend of state and federal law that needs to be a, uh, kind of figured out. That. So is that part of your questionnaire at, at the moment as far as uh, the, the digital footprint at all? Not yet. Not yet. Not yet. You know, most of the people that, that come in still are you know, a little bit older than that. Okay, so you so as far as your clientele, who do you have time right now? Or do you have room to get any more clientele in the pipeline? Because I know, like I said before, you may your your phone uh, is ringing off the hook now. Uh, but do you need? As, what is the perfect client for you right now? I guess first of all, there's always room. Uh, well, we we've, we've got processes in place to always make room for for that. sure. Um, may not be as timely as it would otherwise be, but typically our process is over and done in a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. uh, and we've streamlined things really well so that um, we're able to handle quite a volume, at least as, as within reason, right? Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the typical clientele, though, is a family with a young kid. That's really when we first see people get to know them. And then we go on down the spectrum, uh, and then the next level of people are uh, people are starting to get worried about long-term care and those type of expenses and those real uh, difficult estate planning issues that come on down. Uh, you know, after you get on the other side of that uh, adventure called life. So, how can how can an individual getting reach out to you? I know the your website is best way to do it is yeah, just to shoot out to www.dandblaw.com. Uh, they can schedule an appointment directly off of the website or they can give us a call at 614-408-0529. Perfect. 614-408-0529. We're standing by. <laughs> now, is there, uh, are there any questions that I have not asked that you think will be beneficial for individuals to, to hear? You know, what we haven't talked about, uh, which I think is appropriate for people to just to kind of get a, a base understanding because I've, heard over the years too many times people kind of confuse some of these documents mm -hmm. uh, and i do have a series of videos that are available if people want to walk through them but uh, understand what a living will is and that's very important uh, that's the one that i said that you know, as soon as you're 18 you really should get one what the living will does is that establishes what your wishes are with regard to your care if you're in a terminal condition or a permanently unconscious state essentially affirming uh, that you do or do not want the hospital to continue to provide care if you have been diagnosed terminal and the end is imminent. And if you're in a permanent conscious state, whether or not to be provided nutrition uh, and see what happens uh, if you are in that unconscious state. Mm -hmm. That document works hand in hand with the healthcare power of attorney, which is your appointment as somebody to be your advocate with regard to your care. 
So that is something that regardless of where you come down on your decision for those issues, it's very important that you have that done uh, so that there is no uncertainty uh, because uncertainty in that area can drain the family of, of resources and uh, just the, the, the sheer emotion tied to those decisions um, that really needs to be taken care of. It's all about preparedness, right? Yep. Yeah. And then uh, we talked about what a will is and what that does and how that controls things uh, and trust and those type of things. So those are your, your, your cornerstone documents. Uh, but uh, estate planning, as you mentioned, um, it does touch on all kinds of emotional issues sometimes. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's what you really can't deal with uh, through a online provider typically because they don't uh, nuance those type of issues. So if you got any of those type of things simmering below the surface, you're doing yourself and the family a disservice if you use one of those type of uh, systems because the chances are that you're going to do something wrong, uh, mm -hmm. which is going to now allow all those uh, simmering fights to have a place to uh, kind of bear fruit. And I probably should have mentioned this before. Full disclosure: I have personally used your services in the past, so I, uh, you know, you're uh, you're a pretty solid uh, lawyer. So I appreciate that, my friend. All right, so this is uh, again Luis Ramirez with uh, Greg Dupont from Dupont and Blumensteel. Thank you so much, Greg, for being on the show, and uh, I appreciate you. Thank you, Luis. Take care.